long did you live out here? Well, I started coming out when I was 23 just for the wintertime because it was cold as shit in Canada. Yeah. Uh, and then I moved out in 2010. I was here for a couple of years. Yeah. Okay. And you, you always train at Colts? I always train at Colts. I yeah. love it, man. There was a time when I was um, I was training at Milos' place. So Milos Sarchev. Okay. He, he I was, didn't know uh, that place. Yeah, he Where was, was in Fullerton. Okay. Uh, I mean, if anyone's had the opportunity to watch Milos train, he's – absolute beast and a maniac and i always loved that that was what i loved about bodybuilding was the idea of training hard yeah training harder than anybody else and and there wasn't a lot of guys that really got after it and so Milos was one of those guys but he was wasn't he kind of like a really like you like a smart kind of thinking man's bodybuilder kind very of much that very was like much the attraction for you to, yeah. very much man yeah. yeah he was always the guy who uh, literally i think he coached everybody through the 90s right like really? even, even the guys he was competing against he was coaching a lot of the time wow because they just were like this guy knows what he's doing right so yeah. And everybody just kind of jumped on the bus. And then obviously, like in typical bodybuilder fashion, a lot of everybody jumped on his back went and turned on him at one point. Uh, Interesting. But, yeah, well, why like, was that? Man, who knows? Like, he, he's a very outspoken guy. And, you know, he's he's one who's not going to bite his tongue. So he got a little bit of flack for that. Gotcha. And what, what do you think made him – was there something you could remember that kind of made him stand out as a guy who just knew more and was more intuitive and – well, he's the only guy trying to teach people. So mm -hmm. I used to watch him. Okay. He had a he had a show on bodybuilding.com, and I forget the name of it right now, but um, it was like the, I forget, like the Get Fit show or some, something like that. Um, but I was watching him. Like, he actually had an intelligent way of articulating stuff. Uh, and then you, you hear him talking about the fact that he's training this guy, he's training that guy. You know, he's getting this guy ready for a show, and he's competing in the show too. And I'm like, man, this guy's got to know so much. And then I got a chance to meet him, and I went over to his house, and we went into his office, and I was so impressed with his office because he had – I think he probably had 30 or 40 um, journals. And basically everything he'd put in his body for the last 12 to 15 years was written. like And so wow. like and, and Polaroid pictures every day back in the day of Polaroids. Yeah. Polaroid pictures every single day. And like now when I say everything went in his body, I'm talking about like everything, even the shit you don't want to hear about, yeah. right? Like, you know, yeah, <laughs> we won't get into details, <laughs> but the shit you don't want to hear about. I'm like, God, you know. Uh, took such meticulous care of what went into his body and knew exactly what was going to happen when he did this or did that. Uh, and that's ultimately what bodybuilding is, is removing the margin for error, right? right. Eliminating, eliminating the chance of making a mistake. And he was the king, man. He did more shows than anybody. Um, so he was constantly just testing really? things ever? on himself. Ever? Well, now Dexter's passed him, okay. I think. But uh, at the time, he'd, he'd beat everybody by a long shot. Wow. And when you look at these journals, like – photographic memory as well he'd be like you know i'd ask him about something he goes so it's in that journal right there blue journal page 52 you know third paragraph down and i'm like wow. yeah amazing amazing mind um and you know i had journals of all the other guys he'd ever coached so you know some of the really the biggest names in bodybuilding he had their journals and he'd be like hey man if you see one want to see what this guy did at the 2007 olympia here's exactly his whole prep and you're like this is valuable right like yeah. so you know, even just have access to his mind to try to dial you in for a contest was very helpful. He did actually uh, help me with one contest. Um, so the 2012, 2011, I think, uh, Flex Pro, um, where I ended up going. The day before the contest, I was 293, and I ended up stepping on stage at 283 uh, the, the following day, but the biggest I'd ever been. And my waist was small. Like, I looked great, and I was most of that was was because of him. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So let's let's dive a little deeper then on some of your other biggest influences mm -hmm. throughout the so, years. Yeah, so I started. So maybe how you started training. Yeah, and maybe so, what was what was right about it, what was wrong about it. Sure. How it evolved as you went. Yeah, man. At uh, 15 years old, I started training for sports. I was a great athlete. I loved sports, um, but I always wanted to get faster. So my coach said, "Well, you got to start training. So you got to start training your legs." So I'd go in and I do, you know, like everybody else, leg curls and leg extensions, and I really enjoyed it. I felt like it loosened up my legs, made me faster. Um, so I kind of went every day. So we'd have practice after school, and I'd go for 30 to 40 minutes every day before practice. Um, and then eventually my legs started to respond, um, and, you know, I started lifting a little heavier, taking taking notice. I was weak as shit, man. Like, it's funny that looking back on it, I was curling 10-pound dumbbells and celebrating that. And I, and I remember, man, it's not even a joke, that I remember when I first curled the 17-pound dumbbells, it was like a huge accomplishment for me. Really? Wow. Yeah, I was, I was weak as shit, man. I was, you know, when I started, I was 155 pounds, um, and I was a vegetarian, long-distance runner. Mm. Um, so as soon as I found meat and, and found some weight, my body shifted pretty quick. Wait, so how long were you a vegetarian? Your whole life up until that point? No, a couple of years, man. So, okay. and, and it wasn't an intelligent vegetarian. It was like, yeah. you know, the kid who was told that you're not supposed to eat meat because it's bad for you. So, I was, you know, I'd live on basically That bait. was influenced by your parents? No. Um, just a book you read? Probably a book, okay. yeah. So, but my life like consisted of. Revolution or something like that. <laughs> I don't remember, man. <laughs> yeah. 
um, the the you know, primary constituents of my diet was like muffins, bagels, and <laughs> yeah. fucking apples, and, right. and like shit. Yeah, yeah, it was a terrible existence. And then you know you start putting meat in. And, okay, I honestly started to feel like crap. I noticed my bones didn't feel great. My energy was was poor, and I wasn't getting any leaner like at the time. Um, so you know I started eating meat based on probably reading some magazine somewhere or something or some book. Started eating a little bit more meat and noticed I started getting leaner, putting on weight, adding some muscle, and it went really, really quick. When I actually started diving deep into loving of tr- lo- the love of training, yeah. So some of my early influences, I mean, the first two guys that I remember looking up to greatly were Dorian Yates and Lee Priest. Mm. I mean, I saw a picture of Lee Priest and I just thought he was just ridiculous. And Dorian was always kind of my guy because he just had things that everyone else didn't. Man, certain body parts, he was so complete and so hard. And yeah. I think that's why everybody liked him. And then you, then you see a video of him training. Yeah, God, this guy's just like superhuman. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he was definitely my biggest influence throughout my career. And then, so how, how did your training evolve, like through high school and college? And well, high school, um, like I said, when I started training, I went pretty quick. Um, completely natural, went from one fifty five to two thirty, and that was in about eighteen months. Um, and then the summer before college, before university, I went from 230 to 260. So I went to my first year university at 260, and I was pretty lean, man. I was certainly under 10% body fat, so I think I made an impression. Um, but yeah, training was basically just like modeling the guys at the gym, kind of what everybody else does, right? Yeah. So I was very lucky to have these two guys who are brothers who are still my friends to today uh, who didn't know what the hell they were doing, still don't know what they're doing. But they trained harder than any – to this day, trained harder than any human being that I've ever met. Um, so they taught me work ethic and uh, we literally used to just destroy each other and ridicule each other if you quit and like it was a huge you know dick measuring contest yeah. but ultimately it taught me work ethic and and um, that was kind of my pride point throughout my career was like I took pride in burying anybody that I trained and I would never show weakness um, and that was uh, something I took pride in throughout my career and I think there's something to be said I mean you, you know you can make arguments for submaximal training and not going to failure but I think there's definitely something to be said across the board in life and just doing hard shit exactly you know, like ball building way yeah, harder man. than you're supposed to and yeah like uh, yeah, yeah i call it ball building and especially at that age right like from 17 yeah. to, to 21 like your capacity to recover is incredible right you, like inflammation your body's just dealing with that no problem you've got you have no accumulated stress in your body yet yeah you know so your body just knows how to deal with it you're getting rid of it so easily so the harder you can work between that period the more you can grow and i think that's why i was able to you know, kind of grow more than most human beings because I started so young and it was just effort, man. Yeah. Like just pure effort. And it was frequency. It was a lot of volume. It was probably way more that was than was in quote unquote intelligent now. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it made me a better man. And, and then, you know, you realize that probably is the most important victory in all. Yeah. So, so I mean, nowadays you're known as, you know, one of the greatest hypertrophy coaches. Like you, you know you. more your, your approach to it. Mm-hmm. Um, how does that kind of evolve from from where you were then? And how yeah, you start so, to learn more? Like, okay, this is not right. This is wrong. Sure. I went I went through college uh, with no intention of really being a professional bodybuilder. So first, at 17 years old, I asked my dad if we can go to the Mr. Olympia in New York City. And he goes, sure. So we drove down, and I got to see all these guys. And I was 17 years old. I took pictures with everybody. And So, so who, was, who was, like, competing so, and winning at um, that time? So it was Ronnie three? Coleman's first year. Okay. Uh, he won his first Olympia. And then Flex Wheeler, Kevin Larone. I saw Milos. I saw Jay Cutler. Jay Cutler got 15th. And um, I actually said, I'm like, that's your next Mr. Olympia right there. You can just see it in a structure, man. It's crazy. Um, but, yeah, all the main guys from the 90s, you know, Paul Dillett got sixth. Lee Priest got fifth, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, along those lines. Uh, Chris Cormier was there. So it was a heck of a lineup, man. It was a stacked lineup. And I got to interact with them because back then, I don't know if you were at that Olympia, if you followed it back then, but it was small, man. It was like, I mean, in the audience, there may have been – 1,500 to 2,000 people. Wow. Yeah. It was really small. So we got to interact with them. I got to take pictures. The Beacon Theater, is that right? No, that it was at, um, I thought I remember what's that Madison Square Garden? The um, Yeah, that's the Beacon, attached to the garden. Okay, yeah. yeah. I think it was called something differently, though, okay. maybe. Um, but yeah, that was it. Um, so really, really small and uh, just kind of, you know, you're looking at these guys who previously you thought were superhuman, looking at them in magazines, now they're standing right beside you and you're like, oh. So I go back and I went back to high school and everyone, and everyone goes, man, you're getting so big. And I'm like, Nope, I'm nothing until I look like Flex Wheeler. I used to say it's everybody like because it changes perspective, right? In your in your right. school, you're big, and your gym, you're big. But you go look at these guys, you go, "Fuck, I'm nothing," right? right. So that, I think that was a, a gift for me too, is you know changing your perspective of what's uh, p- uh, what's possible. Mm. Um, so through college, I, like like most people, I trained three times a week, maybe four times a week. Did some really heavy stuff. I was kind of known for the guy who would train really, really known for being the guy who trained really, really heavy. Uh, you know, I was 21 years old, squatting 750, lifting 750 for reps. Um, so throughout college, it was just like, I like to train. I want to get strong. I want to work hard. And that's, that's all I did, man. It wasn't with an ambition of being a professional bodybuilder. 
Um, by the time I was done college, I got a pharmaceutical sales job and I was fat. I'm not really crazy fat, but I was certainly not under 10%. And I was like, well, I want to look like a stud in my suit. I was probably 280. I'm like, I want to get down to, I think I got down to 247 or 250 just so I could look great in my suit. Uh, actually, I got down to 247, I remember exactly, but I did my first show. So I was like, well, I need an external goal. So I set a show and I won. Um, and I, what I noticed, like objectively looking at myself, or I guess objectively looked at myself and I saw massive strengths and weaknesses. I was really great in some body parts and really shit in other ones. So I started to realize like, oh, you know, so I started to kind of play the genetic card. I'm like, oh, it just must be by my genetics. I must have mm-hmm. small arms genetically and a small back genetically, but my quads and, and chest and shoulders are, are just big, quote unquote, genetically, like a lot of people do. Um, I ended up basically getting my pro card in 18 months. So, you know, I had no intention of continuing to compete, but because I won, everyone's like, oh, compete again. So I won every show basically that I entered except for one. Um, got my pro card and people started paying me to work out. So I did my first pro show uh, in 2009 and again, saw these glaring weaknesses and glaring strengths. And I was like, man. Now, Ben, during this time, are you training pretty much like everybody else is training? Because eventually you were known for a unique sure. style and completely different. Yeah. What so was your training like back then? So at 18 years old, 19, I guess, when I went to first year of university, I was looking for someone to kind of be my muscle building mentor, and I couldn't find any. I found Charles Poliquin, uh, but he's not a muscle building guy. He just seemed to be a guy who was really bright. Um, and I was, I was looking, man. I was trying to read everything I could. I got a kinesiology degree, so I always had a, a degree of understanding of what exercise needs to be. I was very curious about how to improve it. And I started looking outside of bodybuilding. I started looking to athletic trainers, Olympic trainers, mm-hmm. uh, people who maybe were a little bit more uh, advanced because I realized bodybuilding was primitive, uh, at least the training in bodybuilding. So um, I wasn't training like everybody else, quote unquote, but I was still training. I was still very much influenced by the magazines, yeah. right? Like this is what these guys do and I got to do that. Like right. I would do tons of heavy deadlifts. You know, like I said, I was doing 750 for reps on deadlifts, but my back never grew. But everyone says, if you want a big back, you got to do deadlifts. I was right. doing four plate bent rows with perfect form. Back wouldn't grow. Mm. You know, I was doing very heavy, strict, quote unquote, strict barbell curls. My arms wouldn't grow. I'm like, well, I just must not have the ability. At my, my level at that point, I didn't understand what genetics really meant. Um, so I was training hard, paying attention to, to being strict, but um, at the same time, didn't really know what that meant. Didn't really know what intelligent muscle building meant. Yeah. Um, so come 2010, uh, so 2009, did my first pro show, got third place, was over the moon, very, very happy, competing against some of my childhood uh, idols, like Dennis James was a guy who I looked up to. He won the show, I got third, so I'm on top of the moon, right? I'm, I'm on top of the world, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to win my next show. So I go away. And I spent eight months um, training twice a day, every single day. I didn't talk to anybody, man. I I made myself a recluse. I did. And I trained every day, twice a day, eat, sleep, and train. Ended up putting on um, about 18 pounds of stage weight, and I got leaner. So it was probably about 20 pounds of stage weight, Mm. and I got killed. So I got destroyed. So I, I was, you know, going into bodybuilding, you're told a lot about um, the politics. You tell us, you know, the, the judges had their favorites. So that was my first thought. I'm like, oh, you know, F these judges. Yeah. Like, these guys are trying to screw me because I'm Canadian. You know, you get this chip on your shoulder. Right. And by the time I kind of got the courage up to, to take a look at the pictures, um, I was critical of myself. I'm like, man, I look like shit. I hate the way I look. My, body, my biggest body parts are really big. My, my weakest body parts were shit. My stomach's getting bigger. Uh, just because I was so focused on get bigger, get bigger, get bigger. And I was the, like, nobody was going to outwork me. I was just so focused, right? Um, so that kind of was my first um, realization that, you know, either I need to change or I need to stop. Mm. And uh, fr- I'm lucky enough to have encountered some intelligent people throughout my life who had been, you know, trying to influence me and say, hey, man, well, try this different style. Think about this. So I had one mentor uh, in particular who comes to mind, and he just kind of started taking me under his wing and being like, hey, man, you know, if you can build any muscle, you can build them all. You're just not directing it, directing the tension the right way. Maybe your training isn't right. And, you know, obviously I'm a pro bodybuilder. I'm arrogant. I'm like, fuck you. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Like, and then, But he, you know, kind of slowly rubbed my ego and, and allowed me to start understanding it a little bit. Uh, and then you, know, you start to see these body parts develop and you start to feel it differently. You start to pick exercises that actually work for you and don't cause injuries and don't hurt. And you're like, oh, man, this feels really good. What the hell have I been doing for the last 10 years? Um, so, you know, I really tried to accelerate that journey as much as possible and just dove into everything. I took every course I could, read every book I could, spent as much time as I could with them. Um, and that's kind of how it started, man. It was like almost out of necessity. I was either like, okay, I'm going to quit, which I thought about. I'm like, I'm quitting bodybuilding. I'm going to go back to, you know, using my brain for something. Yeah. Or I'm going to figure this out. So over the next couple of years, it was really diving into how do I figure this out for me? Not anybody else. Like figure this out for right. me because I need to understand it for me before I can teach anybody else. Yeah. Um, and then by you know 2012 and 13, I had a pretty good understanding of what needed to happen. 
Um, but then life threw me a curveball, man. I had I had children, so uh, my my priorities changed, and uh, you know, bodybuilding kind of took a backseat. And so, so talk about some of the changes you made, and you know what you teach now. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people making? Man, atta- bias, attachment to exercises, attachment to. Um, Sound bites. So, you know, mm. ben, you got to ben, bench big for a big chest. You got to do heavy barbell curls. You got to do heavy compound exercises. Free weights are better than, than machines. It's, right. all, it's all bullshit. None of that is true. None of it is remotely true. Yeah. Um, no exercise is better than another one, um, except as it fits your body and as it directs tension to a muscle, right? So if I have a, um, a muscle building objective, if I'm trying to build muscle, my exclusive objective is not what's happening outside of the body. It's what's happening inside of the body, right? So I can lift 315 pounds on a bench press and get zero recruitment on my chest. Right. Um, or is it, you have another guy who can do 315 pounds on a bench press and get huge pecs. What's the difference? Well, we all have very different structures. Um, so the, the thing that was the biggest shift for me was instead of looking at exercises and being attached to them, like if you want big quads, you get a squat, right? Who hasn't said that? If you want a big back, get a deadlift. Yeah. It's fucking bullshit. It's like a squats may work extremely well for me and destroy your back right. and, and build a huge ass, but no quads. Well, what's the difference? Well, obviously we have different length leg, different like femurs, different size pelvis, yeah. different orientation of your pelvis, different length clavicles. All these things are different. So thereby, logically, an exercise should be different for everybody. Right. So the thing that was different for me was I learned to, to look at exercises. It's so funny because when you say it, it's like, yeah, duh. duh. No one thinks of that. Right. So when I started to look at exercise, rather than being emotionally attached to it, like so many of us are, and actually looking at like objectively and going, well, this is my objective. How do I achieve that objective? And the objective is to to you know eliminate the, fo- the focus on the external and challenge this muscle as hard as possible. It doesn't matter if I'm lifting a pink dumbbell or if I'm lifting a 50-pound dumbbell, as long as I'm accomplishing this internal goal of stimulating this muscle as much as it possibly can at that exact moment in time and acknowledging that that changes in time and it changes at different parts of the range and how can you challenge this muscle as much as possible? Like, it doesn't fucking matter if I'm lifting 700 pounds or 300 pounds. At some level, it has to be progressive, yeah. but it has to be the right muscle doing the job. Otherwise, you're just... You Using other muscles to do the work that what well, this muscle is trying to do, or your ego's taken over and you want to be attached to, hey man, I did this much with this, for, you know, this many reps with this much weight, in which case you're getting no benefit whatsoever. Right. And so, I think the challenge there though is, as as you may or may not agree, when you're trying to help the masses, right, it's easy to pump out those sound bites because it's easy to comprehend, like. Oh, all you have to yes do. and no, man. I think that's just the level of, of knowledge and the level of understanding of the fitness industry, man. And yeah. I say it's 30 years behind the times. Like, people are still training like fucking Arnold, man. Right. And, like, right. Arnold had no scientific data. He was just training on how things felt. And I think that was a huge asset for him. There was no mirrors or fewer mirrors, uh, less, you know, video. Mm-hmm. You know, like, he just got to feel this. Yeah. Or he'd train with his shirt off and he'd watch. He'd be right. like, oh, that muscle looks like it's really working. Or it's not. Yeah. I mean, he didn't have an emotional attachment to, hey, I have to hit my PR in here because this set's going on fucking Instagram. <laughs> right? Yeah, like, yeah. I got to make sure I post my PR today. Like, yeah. there's no emotional attachment to that. The emotional right. attachment is I'm going to fucking win the contest. I'm going to work harder than everybody. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to develop it day by day. I'm going to master this process so that at the end I have this amazing transformation whereas now it's like no no i gotta hit my pr today so regardless of what the form is in the gym it's like oh, I, I gotta be able to post that i did this fucking epic yeah. workout right and that's fucking it's ridiculous so do you think overall general advice you would give to most people that aren't growing lighten the weights first and foremost no man well listen i never say lighten the weights i'm a huge proponent of heavy weights but if, if people are just fucking but, just lifting weights for, right for like you're saying for an instagram pr well, lift an appropriate weight for that muscle yeah. and, and realize that your pec is a fucking small muscle your your bicep is a very small muscle your rear delt is a tiny tiny muscle it's not going to lift huge amounts of weight the only time you can lose huge, huge amounts of weight is if it's a culmination of multiple muscle groups. Mm-hmm. And if that's your objective, if your objective is lifting weight, that's great. But if sure. your objective is, is building muscle, it has to be in isolation. Right. Otherwise, your body's just going to use its strongest parts, right? Uh, you know, if I pick up a weight, if I, if I put a 200-pound dumbbell on the floor, are you going to try to pick up with one muscle or are you going to try to pick up with all of them, right? Okay, your body goes, fuck, i got to use whatever I can to move this weight. My objective is to move this weight. I'm going to do whatever I can. Whereas if you go, oh, that's not my objective. My objective isn't to lift this weight. My objective is to challenge this one specific mm-hmm. muscle. Wouldn't it stand a reason that you got to kind of set up so that that muscle is doing the work? And then whatever, you, however you set up, don't change. Lock your body in stone and just isolate that muscle. So that's one of the cues I teach, man, is once, you know, set up. Set up to advantage the muscle you're trying to work. And then once you found it, fucking don't move. Lock. Mm. Lock your body in stone and then go through that motion like that. And you'll notice a substantial increase in... 
uh, the amount of work to that muscle. But the catch is, it's going to be less weight. Yeah. So people are so egocentrically attached to like, oh, how much weight are you lifting? Well, fucking who cares? My chest is bigger than yours, right? right, right. That's the end of the day. Like, should does load matter? At some level, it does. But f- first and foremost, everything starts with execution. It has to. Yeah. I, I think I saw a video of you one time explaining how guys are using 35s or 40-pound uh, dumbbells on lateral raises, mm-hmm. and you're like, no, I use like tens if I want to do it correctly, right? Something like that. Me personally? Yeah. Well, maybe not. I mean, that no. So I got to but... yeah, I got to the point where I was using substantial weight, okay. and that's why I was able to actually build a tremendous amount of muscle without injury. Um, but, but maybe you had said like you take a guy who's typically doing 35s, exactly. teach him how exactly. to do it right, and he's and only going to do like, tens. You know, and you, eventually you get back up the old. Yeah, guys who come to my gym and they'll be using like the whole stack on leg curls or the you know like the whole stack on some exercises. I'm like, okay, well let's figure out, let's do this right now. Yeah, and they're using like 45 pounds or they, they like <laughs> right. or, or like two two pins on the, on the yeah. weight stack. Like, yeah, but hey, man, when we're using the right muscle, our objective isn't to lift weight. If your objective is to lift weight, then you're not in body. You know, yeah. if you're trying to transform your body and actually accumulate some degree of muscle tissue. It's about challenging the muscle to create an internal response. And we have this external focus, right? So, you know, we grow up as athletes who have to run fast and jump high and score goals. Right. And then we get into, get into sports and it ends up being a competition where I have to lift more than you. Okay, if that's your objective, that's your objective. But if your objective is building muscle, it doesn't fucking matter what happens on the outside except as it creates an internal response. Yeah. People need to get that through their head. It's like, well, what's happening on the inside of my body? Am I creating a neurological stimulus to my nervous system so I might get stronger and recruit more muscle fibers? Am I creating a hypertrophy stimulus, meaning I'm actually going to build some tissue, or am I creating a metabolic stimulus where like, maybe I can burn some calories here, burn some fat? And each of those requires a very different external stimulus. And how many people do you know actually change their stimulus when they go to the gym? Everybody does the same workout. They do what they're good at right. or what they like or what they, you know, they want to get a, get a bigger chest. So they do the same shit over and over. And everyone that's had here's, – here's a really important learning point. Um, you know, you lay down in a bench press and you think it's for your lower chest. I lay down in a bench press and I think it's for my lower chest. Everyone else goes, oh, yeah, it's for my lower chest. I'd say 80% of the population lays down in a bench press and does not work the lower chest. They work their front delts and they work their triceps because mm-hmm. of their mechanics. Some people work their upper chest on a flat bench press, believe it or not, and I can show you that in a video if you want to do a video there. It's, it's so easy to see when you understand what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, so based on the, on the orientation and angle of your sternum, will completely determine what what part of the muscle is being worked. So everyone, if I say, what, Jay, what are you working on a bench press? You know, well, your lower pec or maybe your pec. And the answer is it's not. It's actually, for most people, going to be a little bit of upper pec and mostly delt. Mm. I'm like, oh, well, how come everyone does bench press? Well, because for there's a few guys out there like who are great bench pressers that everyone watches, but they're fucking great bench pressers because they're built to be great bench pressers. Yeah. Not everyone's built to be like that. How many people you know get terribly sore shoulders from bench pressing? Right, a lot. Right, but like, oh, I have to do bench press because this guy over there's got a bench press. No, you don't. You have to learn what to do what's best for you. And it's not complicated. It's very, very simple. But just losing your bias is step one. And that's the first thing I say to everybody is when they come into my camps and my gym, I'm like, all right, I want you to forget everything you think you know about exercise because we're going to challenge it. And the, the fastest way to accelerate your journey is to challenge your, your beliefs. Like, you know, in life, man, like, what do you believe? What do you think you know? Get out of the way, mm-hmm. right? Get out of the way because it's, it's just going to get in your way. It's going to slow you down. So I have a bunch of follow-up questions. One, though, is if you are a former athlete, like you just said, mm-hmm. you're type A personality, and you just live to compete, mm-hmm. how would you kind of, you know, blend that in the workout? Like, can you go in and do, like, you know, a PR on something, and then the rest of the workout is kind of yeah, that man. concept? So I see that to everybody. Like, the first and, first and most important thing about fitness is you got to love it. Yeah. So if you love doing CrossFit, go fucking do CrossFit. Right. If you love to run, go run. I'm not going to be the guy who says, don't do that. Like, if you love it, that that's the first and most important thing. Yeah. Um, but subsequent to that, then you look at your goals. What do I want to do? So get your you know, get your uh, jollies out of the way. Get yeah. whatever you enjoy doing out of the way. And then, okay, let's get down to business. Or conversely, go the other way. I would say, like, if I know I need to change my body and get leaner, mm-hmm. do that first when yeah. I have the most energy. And at the end, now I can do the stuff that I like. So it's like a reward for yourself. Right. You know? So either way, man, it doesn't really matter. But I, I strongly believe, like, you know, if it was me, I'd address my goals first. And then subsequent to that, like, okay, now we're done that. We can do what I like. Yeah.